Deer have only two types of movement, natural and forced. More simply put, moving naturally when they want to, or being forced to move by someone or something. In hunting the natural movement patterns, we wait for opportunity to happen. We predict the spot it'll happen by studying their habits, but the deer chooses the time to be there. Forcing the deer to move, however, both creates opportunity where there was none and allows the hunter to choose the time. However, the deer now only knows the path of movement and many hunters feel discouraged because they don't know the spot. But just as we predicted the spot for natural movement hunts by studying their habits and sign, you can also apply certain facts, traits, and terrain characteristics to predict their forced movement patterns. And there are definite patterns that will increase your odds dramatically when choosing a post on your next forced movement hunt. With just a little practice, you can feel very confident and you now get to choose both the time and the spot, which also now makes opportunity happen instead of only waiting for it to happen. Through the short range needs of bow hunting, we have to get very close to deer without alerting them to our presence. We must approach the cover with extreme caution, and because of this, we have been seeing a high rate of mature deer and have found that the more perfect our approach, the bigger and more mature the deer we end up seeing. We therefore believe that the approach is without a doubt the single most important element of any hunt, forced or otherwise. And here's why. A yearling has a high tolerance of man, mainly because he doesn't understand your presence. He pays attention only to what is directly around him, often an area as little as a 15-yard radius, and this is usually the point where he'll see you, which is why fawns commonly have to just about be stepped on to move. A one-and-a-half-year-old deer has a larger attention bubble where if penetrated by your sound, smell, or sight, would become uncomfortable with you. But his lack of experience usually causes him to hesitate. Then he'll run out of fear and usually in a foolish direction.
A two and a half year old pays attention to a somewhat larger area. He needs more of a comfort zone and he has learned what you smell like and sound like. He is annoyed by you. And when you penetrate his comfort zone, he knows to be looking for you while he's moving. He'll react quicker and with less stimulation, but still he moves out of fright. At this point, it is important to understand why a deer moves when forced. We have found that an immature deer moves away from you out of fear of you. A mature deer, however, moves away from you to avoid detection by you. A three and a half year old is sometimes marginal in maturity but a four and a half year old and up is definitely mature and will not tolerate your presence or you knowing his presence. He has a very large attention bubble, commonly several hundred yards in radius and at times a half a mile or more. The border will be the distance that every safe sound and sight can be heard and kept track of. He will know the routine of these sights and sounds and begin considering his exit at the first awareness of your non-routine presence in his comfort zone. Such as turning your engine off at the early dawn hour, much less the car door syndrome. The difference is he moves to avoid being found out and in a wise direction and he'll move before he has to. Respecting the awareness of mature deer by adopting mature deer techniques and approaching every hunt quietly, into the wind, and on foot as though there's a five and a half year old in there looking for you will allow you to see all the deer in the woods instead of just the scared ones. And when I realized he was running right to me, 
I was trying to make the decision to shoot, you know, when, when he was coming toward me or let him go by and shoot him broadside. And all of a sudden he made the decision for me. He just slammed on the brake. But it was so unexpected that he stopped that I just shot too quick. I mean, it was just, in other words, he's running, running, here he comes, here he comes, what should I do? And all of a sudden he, he stopped and I go, you know, in my mind, I'm going, he stopped, shoot quick, you know, and I, and I just shot right over top of him. I mean, I can't believe everybody's here. Okay, so when they come out of that pump thick woods, they're running this way, and they run by that red dot tree. Okay? But when they're pushed this way, I think they're going to stay up this way. I don't think they're going to come by them. Yeah. I think when they come out of the, the thick stuff behind the pump, and they come this way, heading for the middle woods. Right. Okay? Right. Okay, because... When we're pushing it from the pump this way, we're pushing it downwind because of also our sand, the standard sand doesn't move the deer. When the wind's going the opposite way, I think they're going to do the same thing. They're going to run up through that semi-open stuff, heading for the thicker stuff, because they got the wind at their back and they want to be able to see where they're going to yeah, go. Yeah, but why would they take, if the woods are perpendicular this way? But before even attempting a force movement hunt, or push, as we call it, the pusher and the stander must have a complete understanding of their objectives. Since terrain and cover varies, the objectives will be different depending on the situation. That when we push it this way, I think they'll circle and they'll come in the top side this way. Whatever, but I just have a gut feeling they're going to go right up. That little gully, those little knobs with that perpendicular gully going right this side of the red. <clears throat> well, you're sitting on the stand, you call him. You go, go where you feel comfortable, we'll go where you have confidence, because you just better hope yeah. you're not wrong. Okay, well, we're going to put a push on. We're going to push these woods, and I, I'm expecting the deer to come down this run. The wind is going like this. Now, in order for me to approach my stand, I don't want to walk up this run and send it up because any deer that come running down the run, usually you know the buck might be 50 feet or a minute behind the does. And if I walk right up this run, which is the easiest path, they're going to cut my track when I was approaching the stand. And if those does run down the run first before the buck gets there and cuts your track where you came in on the main run, they'll blow back and then they'll turn that buck and you'll never even see them. They'll go right back. So the wind's going this way like this. The way, you, the way you want to get on stand is to get on the downwind side of the run and parallel it, not walking in to it on the main run. And I'll be catching deer that are coming this way and I'll be downwind and the, the run won't be set up. He was, we're, on, we're on stand right there, and a one doe runs right up to us, and you can hear him behind going, uh, 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 like this, and two more, another doe comes up on this side, and then with one with him, and this one here, Rick said the wind at us, you know, I mean, we, we got to use some kind of cover scent, because every time the wind is, they run right up to me and go, <laughs> <laughs> we had the one doe come up to us here. She came running right out, and uh, she hit our wind and did a 360 <laughs> and jumped guy. in the river. <laughs> really? Swan dive? Mm-hmm. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Swam the distance. Yeah. 
Did you see? Did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see the rack. I saw a big body. I mean, he was twice as big as any doe. But I didn't see the rack. But if I did see him, he probably would have gone 14150. <laughs> He was a 10.2. He would have been a 10.2. Yeah. <laughs> when a runs up to us and goes, it doesn't win, Jeff. I mean, <laughs> what the hell would win to this? <laughs> runs right up 15 feet from us. He goes, <laughs> The ideal objective of the pusher should be to only move the deer to the standard. Instead of running the deer by the standard. The ideal objective of the standard is to choose a spot that he will get a deer that he might see. Instead of choosing a spot to see deer that he only might get, Also, the pusher needs to understand that you generally have to stimulate at least two senses to make a deer actually run, such as see and hear you, or see and smell you, or hear and smell you. Stressing only one of the senses most commonly causes the deer to just alert and or sneak away. Since the goal is to avoid making him run, the pusher should alert no more than two and usually only one of the senses. How come nobody will get behind you with you? <laughs> with you? We all get behind you. We get behind you. <laughs> uh, my thumb is longer than those spikes. <laughs> yes. Somebody get behind him, Ronnie Brown. Huh? Uh, he'll make s gestures or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> get behind that helicopter headed to me. <laughs> types of deer cover, stable and unstable. Stable cover is the type that is big enough and or thick enough that the deer don't have to leave it in order to get comfortably away from the pusher. An example of the unstable type is wide hedgerows or small wood lots that the deer would certainly have to leave it to get comfortably away from the pusher. In pushing stable cover, the stander wants to set up in the cover that is being pushed. In pushing unstable cover, the stander usually sets up in the next cover that the deer will be heading to.
Now let's take the stable cover type. Okay, here's the patch. We've got alfalfa here. The river goes around here like this. It makes a bend like here and then goes out this way. All right, this is all basically timber. We're going to push it this way. The wind is coming across this way like this. <clears throat> now, usually I jump the buck's bed just about in the middle in that thick stuff like this, all right? So what I'm thinking is I think we have to have one setup. There's, there's some scrapes and everything right in here. We've got to have one setup right in here to catch movement coming out through here. We could have another setup over in here where you can see that. You can get a good shot coming up that slew, but still so you can see over along, along the lip. The drivers are going to come in here and it'll work parallel like this. When, when this driver on the inside gets to like in here, he's going to slow down and let the driver on the outside catch up. In fact, get a little bit in front. So you have one driver here and the other driver over a little bit ahead of him. Give him time to get a little bit ahead and then work it back and forth. The reason they want this guy ahead is this guy is going to be jumping the deer bedded to try to keep them from breaking the river and jumping the river this way. So this guy here will be up in here, and this guy will be here. When this guy jumps the deer bedded, they're going to hear this guy, and they're not going to want to break to the river, and they're going to want to swing in front of them. So you want the river guy to stay ahead of this guy. Right. But if they move too slow, they're going to have to double back. You're going to have to keep going pretty fast. Well, you're going to, now you're going to have to be weaving pretty fast. Where's the wind? The wind's coming this way on this. What's, the, what's going to stop you from busting straight yeah. across the outbound? Nothing. We can only, you know, Other than the fact that they, I think they know we're here. Right. Over here. Right, exactly. Since the stander now knows that the deer will be only moving over into his part of the woods and not running, he will want to approach from downwind to a spot where the deer will come close to and hopefully hesitate. Yeah. 
I mean, if I had him right there, I had him within 10, 15 feet of me, looking, standing, looking at me, and I couldn't draw any of the runs. Can the stander choose the best spot in so much woods? The key is that a deer must stop moving any time he becomes uncertain of the safety of his cover or uncertain as to where the pusher is.
So, the rule then becomes, a forced move deer has only two things on his mind. Where is my predator, and how safe is my path? What the standard then looks for is where the lay of the land or density of the cover will break the certainty of the deer's path. He'll need to hesitate there and that spot becomes one of the standard's options. The deer will become uncomfortable with not visually knowing the safety of the woods ahead while down in the break. So he hesitates and surveys just before becoming temporarily blinded. This spot then becomes the target. Again, he stops before being blinded, not during or after. In the case of the cover break type stand, whereby the changing density of the cover breaks the certainty of the deer's path, the deer will want to move from secure cover to another secure cover within the overall cover that's being pushed. The deer willingly accepts the blindness of the dense thicket for the comfort of security and then tunes in for the sounds and the scent of the pusher. Short straw. 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 Short straw.
Unlike the terrain brake stand, the stander then now chooses the blind spot to set up in, and generally at the far downwind side of the secure cover. Since deer most commonly hesitate after passing through a thicket. This then allows them to visually scan the woods ahead should they need to break to the next cover. And this thick cover they just passed through also serves as a barrier whereby they can more easily hear and smell the predator through. This then becomes the spot the stander wants, but again, not a spot with the most view to see the most deer, but instead the right spot to get a deer. Again, the downwind edge of the thick cover within the cover and at the point usually where the deer would have to leave the woods should the pressure be too severe. In both stable and unstable cover, it's the pusher's job to sheepdog the deer. If it goes too slow, however, the deer will have too much time to make certain their path, plus the pusher and the stander's position. If he moves too fast, the mature bucks usually double back.
The pusher should try to confuse the deer by only letting them know that he's in the woods and moving closer by occasionally snapping a twig every few minutes and in a different spot. He should also use the wind to scent move the deer. I hate it for you, I really do. He was big. He was really, really big. Can, uh... Well, since you didn't get him, uh... Can I be the one to tell the guys you missed? What? Can I be the one to tell the guys you missed? Making pushes with loud and frequent noises such as yelling and talking eliminates the deer's confusion since the pushers, regardless of their numbers, give away their position. The scare tactic invites the mature deer double back and usually only reveals the immature scared deer to the standers. A good buck simply doesn't want to leave the woods and risk exposing himself. So, we believe that older bucks especially dislike trading stable cover for distant cover. However, when a good buck senses that his presence has been found out, either by your sighting or extreme close pressure by the pusher, then the unstable cover tactics will apply. When cover is unstable, either by size, density, or pressure, we have found the deer movement patterns to be simply this. The deer have to leave the cover and expose themselves. And once exposed, wind direction is rarely a factor to them. They simply want new, undisturbed cover. However, we have found it's the path that's different between a young and an old deer.
A young, scared deer only needs enough distance to ease his fear. So commonly, the next woodlot, or even the next, is all that is needed to relax them. A mature buck, however, especially the five-and-a-half-year-old class, once found out, needs a totally new comfort zone. Another sanctuary where his presence can't be found out again. So he won't be looking for the next little woodlot or even the next. He's looking for the shortest, fastest path to a different part of the country altogether. So if you think a big buck is present and the woods unstable or the pressure great enough, then don't bother standing the stepping stone path of an immature deer. Stand the path that is the shortcut to Never Never Land, because if he does have to leave, he'll run tail tucked and non-stop with no regard to wind, exposure, or terrain. And five miles is not uncommon. And when pushing the valley floors in hilly or mountainous country, the good bucks seem to prefer first up, then back, and hunting these escape benches can produce some quality animals. So when it's the middle of the day and nothing is happening, and you want to make opportunity happen, or the deer are in a place where their natural movement patterns can't be hunted, or the big bucks just simply don't want to move in the daytime, we hope you'll consider their forced movement patterns. This is Rick Bloss, and speaking for all of us at Whitetail Visions, we wish you your best season this season.